Hello and welcome to episode 42 uh, and we're revisiting recording grand pianos. If you uh, remember we went to a friend of mine Grant's house and we recorded his Yamaha Grand and uh, he's a proper pianist. The thing that really annoyed me a little bit was that we were so limited in time. We had to get in, set the gear up, do some recordings and then I came back to the studio and did the editing. And I felt I didn't really explore putting microphones in slightly different positions enough. So what I've been doing is recording my piano. Now, you have to accept the fact that I'm not a particularly brilliant pianist, mm -hmm. but I can play enough that it can take quite a while to record things. Um, the thing that I've obviously done is set myself aside enough time that I can experiment with microphones. And what I've done is picked my favourite pair of AKG 414s. I then thought, OK, what else can I do? So my initial thought was that I'd go back to using the U87, but I've only got one. So that's a bit limiting because pianos in mono sound a little bit thin and weedy. I know that's how it was done for years, but realistically, um, we're used to stereo. So it then occurred to me that what I could do is use the Neumann 87 to give me a nice round sound from the piano in its position. And then maybe I could try adding a ribbon so I could do MS stereo. Now, it's not really stereo, is it? Because we've got a left and we've got a right. But a grand piano at the best is about six feet wide. So the width of it is going to be really whatever your monitoring speakers are at home. So it sounds really weird. <laughs> I tried it in a theatre where the speaker stacks are actually 20 odd metres apart. It sounds extremely odd. It's too wide. Far, far, far too wide. So I tried in the office with the speakers on the desk and it sort of worked. So in the recording session, what I did was use the U87 and then put a ribbon in quite low down to the strings facing the bass strings and the treble strings. Now, not a huge amount of noise comes off the top octave or so of a Yamaha grand piano. It's very percussive. I mean, think if you think about it, the hammers hit the strings. They're so tight and they're so short that they don't actually flex very much. So you get this quite plinky plonky sort of sound. So what I ended up doing was concentrating on everything bar that right one octave at the top. Uh, it seemed to get picked up by whatever technique I used because it's a mainly percussive sound and it doesn't have anything down the bottom. So the vast majority of the sound is coming from the high mids down to the very lows. And so the piano at home uh, can explore all those. And I had a good fiddle about with what worked and what didn't work. And on this particular piano, because sadly they all do seem to be slightly different. I mean, my, my Yamaha is a G2, so it's an older Yamaha. Uh, and it's shorter than my friend Grant's, which is a C3, which is a bit bigger uh, and rounder and nicer and more expensive. You get the idea. So my piano sounds OK. So that's what I was going to record. So we did the AKGs did the Neumann and the Ribbon. Well, I didn't really know what it was going to sound like, but I'm quite pleased with it, actually. And I just had arrived at the office a couple of mics that uh, were used for stage pianos. So basically, they're little Chinese condensers. They're really cheap. Um, they're about £50, something like that. And they've got like a little gooseneck, so you can adjust the angle. Um, they're designed to be flown from a ceiling, so they hang above a stage or a group of people. They're good for choirs and stuff like that. And I noticed that the manufacturer had a small magnetic mount for them. So what I did was I thought, I'll try that, because these little mag mounts, little blocks of rubber with a magnet inside and a slot at the top that the gooseneck clips into. So 
I plonked those into the rubber mount and stuck them on the Yamaha. Um, and just for a bit of difference, I tried clipping the left hand one to the angle of the lid. So the left hand mic was just dangling down off the lid and the right hand one was actually clipped to the frame. Um, sort of see if I could get a difference in the sound. Uh, it didn't actually make it as big a difference as I thought. The, the frame mounted microphone was certainly um, a bit thinner at the bottom end, but it sort of worked okay. I mean, with no EQ, they were definitely a sort of bass light sound. Um, for live, no bother at all. You just bung a bit of EQ in and away you go. And also the good thing about them for live use is that they don't look nasty. I mean, when you look at some of the pictures in this video of a couple of boom stands with whacking great isolation mounts on, um, they're ugly things. And of course, no matter what make boom you've got, and these the ones I've got are K&Ms, um, no matter what you do with them, if you don't tighten them up enough, a heavy mic gradually forces it down till it touches the strings. And that's a bit embarrassing live. You can get away with it on a recording, just lift it up again. But if you've put one on a grand piano on stage and it suddenly does a nose dive, you look a bit stupid. So it did get rid of that sort of problem, I think. Um, the last microphone pair was intended to be a pair of AKG 451s. They're another uh, vintage microphone that I, I quite like. And I set them up putting the 451 in the position that the Neumann 87 had been in, which for the Neumann seemed to work. And it gave me quite an average result on the 451s. And the 451 on the treble end um, was really horrid. And I decided not to use it. So I moved the bass AKG 451 just a little bit to give me a coverage of the whole piano. Um, I think if you actually put these into sort of your computer, added a little bit of gentle reverb, added a little bit of EQ, they'd all be salvageable. But if you wanted to critically listen, then to my mind, there's only one real winner. And the, the winner, I think, is still the 414s. Um, although the stereo effect on the um, Neumann 87 with that ribbon mic, which is not a particularly expensive ribbon mic. I mean, it's, it's one I've had for a while. Um, it was quite pronounced. Now, it uses MS, of course, to do that. And so in the DAW, that's nice and easy. You just duplicate the track, flip the polarity on one of them, pan one left and pan one right. And then you can bring in the width on the couple of faders. I just gang them together. Um, and just by shoving those faders forward, you can take it from mono and add some space. And that works quite well. Um, I thought it'd also be interesting for the video to add uh, a stereoscope. So on the output of the DOW, I bunged a stereoscope. And um, it's fascinating watching what's going on. Uh, the display, when it's a mono signal, absolutely, you know, it's just a vertical line. There's no width information whatsoever, exactly as you'd expect. But as soon as you go to any of the stereo techniques, so the 2414s, or the 87 and the sideways facing one, as soon as you go to those, that stereo field fills up with the most amazing, interesting patterns. Now, that's really all of the stuff in the left and the right having a difference, and it shifts constantly. So when we're looking at stereo, we, we always get the impression we just get sort of constant width. But when you look at how the waveforms interact and shift, that's where that slightly big sound comes from. And it's weird to see it actually happening, because if you play one note, you would expect to just have width information, but it moves. And that's very odd to look at and makes you realise that when you do put multiple microphones onto any source, you are creating something a bit special 
and perhaps it could be argued maybe just a bit artificial who knows it works uh, let's not knock it so in the video I duplicated the section with the Neumanns um, what I did with the Neumanns was um, the Neumann goes on its own the first time through so you hear it in mono and then the second time through I've added in the side channels so you can hear the difference between just the Neumann and then the Neumann and the ribbon at the same time and you'll have to decide if you like one the other or both so that's basically what it's all about so sit back listen and watch see what you make and I don't mind at all if you hate some of it and love some of it um, but I think it's a good example of what you can do uh, I tried to play some stuff that's loud some stuff that's quiet some that's lowish some that's trebly up the top just to give you an impression of how those two microphones or in some cases just the one microphone managed to actually capture that so that's the plan see what you think
Okay, um, what do you make of that? Like it? Hate it? Uh, I think it was quite interesting to see what happened and hear how some of those mics, I mean, like those 50 quid condensers, um, they didn't do a bad job, say with a bit of EQ and a bit of massaging, maybe with a little bit of reverb or something. They'd be quite usable. Um, I don't particularly like the sound of the Neumann on its own. Not when you've listened to the various stereo versions. So for my money, the AKG wins. The AKG 414 pair wins. Um, but I'm not sure on the others. It's a bit difficult. Um, what do you think? Do any of the mono things work? I don't think the 451 at the end worked particularly well. Um, you could make it okay with a bit of work. But the 414s, at the sort of distance you could see in the video, seem to do a pretty good job. Anyway, if you want to leave some comments below on what you really thought, I'm perfectly happy. Even if you say it was awful, uh, but don't shoot the piano player. Anyway, that's episode 42 for you. Hope to see you on the next one. Look after yourselves and take care.